Ladies and gentlemen, my dear young friends, we enter the year 2024 witnessing an accelerated pace of progress in science and technology driven by artificial intelligence. In science, weather prediction models based on AI systems are now able to forecast extreme weather conditions with unprecedented accuracy. And recently, the scientific community has started to acknowledge the AI systems that is able to solve complex protein structures that originally has taken entire PhDs to complete. And history has shown us that whenever there is a leap forward in breakthroughs in science, there accompanies a development in technology that is bound to improve the human condition. In remote communities where there's a shortage of doctors, AI systems are being deployed. A resident at those communities can connect a small ultrasound device to their phone and leverage on-device AI system to examine that medical image and to decide whether further medical assistance is required. For those who have lost an arm, they can now use a robotic arm connected to their body and use AI systems as a way to translate the signals from their brain into electronic signals, which in turn is able to connect the robotic arm. We see that AI systems can bring all of these benefits to human welfare. And indeed, in doing so, we can help advance the economy as well. AI systems are able to help us in these ways because they know about us, and they know about us through our data. So how can we develop AI systems that re respect our privacy? Now, this is a complex task. Whereas my peers and colleagues are focused on creating innovations in the AI systems, I help in research that help to bring in the fruits of this research into you, the consumers, in particular, privacy. Again, the issue of privacy is a complex topic. So let us start at a familiar place with your phone and the most commonly used app on your phone. That's your keyboard. Your keyboard is able to autocomplete sentences. It's able to suggest the net next words. And the more you interact with such systems, the better these systems become. And the developers of such systems hope that whenever a system gets more accurate and more performant on one device, that this capability gets transfer transferred into other devices as well. So what if your smart keyboard gets really good at auto-completing your private information, and this capability is endowed on another user's device? So under appropriate prompting of this language model, another user may be able to output sensitive information that you may use to auto-complete. And indeed, recent research has shown that popular large language models that is not only capable of auto-completion, but also able to write essays for us, are able, under the right prompting, to recite verbatim the articles that they have been trained on. And many times, these articles are copyrighted. So you see this problem is very prevalent. Now, the scale of the privacy issue is as large as the human population itself. Whenever an AI meets a human, this proper this problem exists. And that is why, throughout the globe, regulations are being developed so that they hold developers of such technologies accountable to think critically about AI systems for privacy and also to act deliberately and accordingly to make sure that these systems are private. And for the consumers, the users of these products, by having a better knowledge and having a better informed understanding of the privacy aspect, you can make better choices, more intelligent choices that help protect yourself. In Canada, we will have the Artificial Intelligence and Data Act. And in the United States, while specific AI regulations are being developed, a particular act called the Algorithmic Accountability Act outlines a number of state-of-the-art privacy-enhancing technologies that is currently being deployed to make sure your smart keyboards preserve privacy. In this talk, we'll explore these and also more of these. We'll start off with the basic con conception of privacy preservation, the anonymization. 
Now, the naive notion of protecting privacy is simply to remove all personally identifiable information from a data set being used to develop such a technology. And this seems perfectly private until Netflix has once put out a challenge to the open scientific community to, de to develop a better recommendation system for their movies. As part of this challenge, they have released a data set of movie ratings. They have removed all of the personally identifiable information from this data set, such as name, and they've released this data set into the clear. You might think this is safe, but unfortunately, a privacy attack has been successful. So how could this have been possible? Ethical privacy hackers have leveraged an alternative auxiliary open data set called the Internet Movie Database, or you might know it as IMDB, containing this information about movie ratings, but also the personally identifiable information. So by comparing these two data sets, one that is anonymized by Netflix and another that is pu publicly available, they're able to find matches of similarities and the result of this has been a very accurate re-identifications of the anonymized data in the Netflix data set. So we see that naive notions of privacy does not hold, and so we need something stronger. Now we're gonna turn to another app on your phone, the photo gallery app on your phone. So let me start by explaining this. Suppose you wanted to know something sensitive. You wanna take a poll of a belief of the population, such as a controversial topic, such as whether AI would pose existential risk, some people may not be comfortable sharing their belief. If you do not think this is controversial, you may substitute it with another controversial topic that people may not be comfortable sharing their opinions of. Well, how may we take such a poll in a private fashion? We take the true belief, and then we flip a coin. We introduce some randomness, and depending on the outcome of the coin flip, we're gonna respond yes or no. And scientists are able to l collect all the information by the entire population who has, suggest who has submitted to this poll, and in fact, to recover the actual rate in which the population holds the belief. Now, this is a simplified version of a specific algorithm used on your phone, in your photo app, to choose one photo among your entire gallery to d display to you as your most memorable, iconic photo. So we have seen that there are indeed more sophisticated algorithms to protect your privacy. And in today's world, the state of the art framework to reason about privacy is called differential privacy. It is a framework above all that allows us to quantify privacy, to put a number to it and to reason about it in a rigorous way, to be able to devise mathematical proofs to certify the privacy levels of systems that we develop. Now to illustrate the ideas of this complicated topic, we're gonna use some analogies. The behavior of a machine learning system differs when, it, when your data is included in it or it's not. And an attacker may use this difference to reverse engineer your private information. So how might we blindfold the attacker from this distinction? Differential privacy tells us that we might be at able to add a little bit of noise to this so that whatever the deterministic behavior of the system is, we make it a little bit random. So that when we have two systems, one trained on your data and one trained without your data, after randomization, these two look almost similar, almost indistinguishable for the attacker. And this is the way we can use to hide your data like a drop of water in a pond of water. Now, the machine learning process is similar to skiing downhill. The objective is to minimize the error rate, just like a skier wants to ski downhill and minimize their height. Now, the machine learning system is going to leave a track when it does this, much like the skier. So an attacker is able to look at this trail left behind and to reverse engineer many sensitive information. What differential privacy does is to add randomness to this trail so that an attacker cannot distinguish the randomness injected by differential privacy and the difference caused by your data being in present or absent from the data set. Now, besides differential privacy, there's another paradigm that we can use to protect privacy, and that is not to share your data at all. 
In the field which I work in, healthcare, hospitals cannot easily share their patient records for privacy reasons. And there are also practical limitations to sharing data. Perhaps if we're thinking of a self-driving system, when we deploy such systems to the real world, they encounter scenarios which are not present in the lab when we try to develop such systems. So when we deploy these things into the real world, we want them to be able to learn right where they are and to use this to improve upon the other systems that are out there. And federated learning is this paradigm of collaborative machine learning decentralizing the learning process. And by not sharing your data at all, we're able to protect your privacy. Now, besides sophisticated systems such as self-driving systems, we know that these systems will be likely to be de deployed into your um, technologies in the future. And this is because of the increased computational powers on your mobile devices and the drop in prices of your mobile plans. So your devices are more able to improve and also communicate this improved version with other people and to improve the systems deployed on their systems as well. Now there's a problem to this of involving a lot of people in the machine learning process. Namely, there are bad people on the internet. There might be adversaries who are going to try to poison your machine learning process and try to mess things up. What we try to do to combat this issue is to blindfold the participants through what's something called secure multi-party computation. This is a format of cryptography which is able to mask everybody's contribution so that if an attacker finds only one copy, something that's sent by one individual, they're not gonna be able to discover what the true thing is because it is encrypted. But once all of these things are put together, when they are aggregated together, then the true outcome emerges because the noises all cancel out. And this system is being used today on all of your devices, in your keyboards and other systems to protect your privacy. Now sometimes, unlike what is in the common perception that machine learning systems use a lot of uh, data, you know, language models, popular language models out there use tons of data, they use almost the entire internet. Actually, um, just the GP3, GPT-3 model, uh, you can download the data that's used to train it, almost the entire internet today when you get home, it's called something called common crowd. But in healthcare applications, sometimes we just don't have enough patient records to tell us about a disease. So what we wanna do is to generate data which look like actual real data. The benefit of this is that we have not only more data, but also data which is not attributed to real individuals, but rather data which is able to be representative of the entire population and still serve to develop very good machine learning systems. Now it's not only for the people who use these products that they should care about privacy, but it's also for the developers of such systems. And what I'm about to tell you next could, what could save developers millions of dollars. Now, once a customer's data is entered into the training data set used to develop machine learning systems, the client could revoke access, remove permission to use their data at any point. So what happens when a system has already been trained on the data, and now all of a sudden the client asks the developer to remove their data set? Now this is as hard as having baked a chocolate chunk cookie and asking the chef to remove the chocolate chunk from the cookie. So when we're developing such systems, we must take into consideration of what happens when someone wants their data removed. This is in fact a very difficult problem even currently the current way to do this may be just to throw out your model and then train a new one. And this is really costly. So we do have to be careful when considering the privacy issue of using people's sensitive data. Now, many centuries ago, Leonardo da Vinci has been captivated by bird flight. In his Codex on the Flight of Birds, he envisioned machines that mimics the bird flight and many years later, we have had the airplane. In our century, scientists and engineers are taking even more sophisticated task, that of repl replicating intelligence on a computer. And unlike in the bird flight and airplane, progress has been much harder, uh, much e faster. 
with the accumulation of knowledge, our rate of progress has been even faster. Now, with the rate of progress being proportional to the amount of knowledge that we have built up, this is exponential growth in the rate of progress. And surely, more systems are going to enter into our daily lives. When we reimagine the way that humans interact with technology, we must ask the question, how does systems we develop respect our privacy? And this is part of our lifelong learning. For those of us who have left school, by being more aware of these aspects of privacy-preserving machine learning, we can make better choices as consumers. And for those of us who are still in school, this is part of your AI literacy. Developments in artificial intelligence is bound to speed up the economic progress, to deliver human welfare. And with such development, and may the, may the force of privacy-preserving machine learning benefit us all. You've been a wonderful audience. Thank you very much.